Uh, so now I invite uh, Gabriela uh, Mejias, uh, who's going to talk to us uh, particularly about PID work uh, that's going on uh, in the FAIR Impact Project. Something. So uh, the FAIR Impact Project is a European Commission funded project uh, through the Horizon Europe Framework. It's a three-year project. It started in June last year. It's led by DANS, um, a Dutch organization, and it involves 26 uh, partners uh, working together to expand FAIR solutions across um, EOSC. Um, and we've seen uh, earlier today uh, on Thomas and uh, Maria's presentation uh, why uh, PITs are important for uh, DMPs. Um, uh, Maria mentioned uh, DOIs as a PID for DMPs and how um, the metadata can be connected to identifiers for contributors like ORCID uh, or affiliations like ROAR. So I'm going to talk uh, about the work Fair Impact is doing to um, better uh, harmonize persistent identifiers uh, across the European Open Science Cloud. So um, persistent identifiers and their associated metadata are crucial to the implementation of the FAIR principles, identifiers, or metadata are mentioned in each one of uh, the principles. And um, with this project, which is a support and coordination action, what we're trying to achieve is to um, improve and increase the implementation of identifiers and metadata throughout EOSC. And for this, we're going to work with different stakeholders and I'm going to show you that work um, here. Um, so this um, work package is divided into four, into four tasks. The first one um, is led by Datasite. Here, we're focusing on service providers, on persistent identifier service providers, on the second task, led by CSC, we're working on promoting best practices, paid best practices uh, into uh, fair data management uh, processes. Um, the third task is about um, the EOS PID policy and how to support the community to align uh, to uh, that policy. And um, the fourth task is led by uh, SURF, and they are going to run an implementation uh, PID program. And you can also see the other partners uh, working on each task. And um, the first task is about persistent identifiers uh, provider. What we want to achieve um, is a bridge between the persistent identifier providers and the EOS community and its stakeholders. Uh, and um, we want to uh, ensure better and a more streamlined um, coordination of persistent identifiers, make sure uh, we have a mechanism to coordinate them and also to onboard uh, new uh, identifier providers as they emerge. And here you can see a roadmap of um, the outcomes we have planned uh, for this task. So we're actually on the first one. Um, last week, we um, delivered the first uh, report, uh, which is a shared value proposition developed uh, with persistent identifier providers. So last year in the EOSC symposium, we organized a hybrid session. We invited um, 15 uh, PID providers and also um, the EOS community. And we worked together uh, mapping uh, roles, defining the EOS PID policy. And we also um, discussed current um, pain points or issues um, many stakeholders face across the research ecosystem and how persistent identifiers can help address those issues. And the outcome was a value proposition of the benefits of PITS um, for EOSC um, that was submitted last week, uh, actually. So it's currently under review, but hopefully next time I'll be able to share uh, more um, with you. The second uh, step is going to be the proposal of a coordination mechanism um, to coordinate the work of PIT providers in uh, EOSC. And um, the third is going to be uh, to align uh, requirements to onboard, so to welcome uh, new PITs that might emerge into the EOSC. And the end result, the last uh, long-term deliverable, is to establish a shared um, vision for uh, how 
speed providers should be implemented in EOSC. And um, the second task, this one is led by CSC, is about promoting uh, best practices of PITS into fair data management. And uh, on this task, we are working with uh, use cases and uh, different uh, kind of uh, topics. So the first one is data uh, management uh, workflows. And here we're partnering with uh, UCRI STFC, CNR, CNR, INRIA and the University of Manchester. Um, then we have uh, another uh, group of use cases working on uh, best practices um, for peer integration uh, to manage sensitive data. And here we're working with the University of Essex and uh, EMBL EBI. And the last uh, focus is um, complex data citation and how to integrate PITs into these workflows. And here we're partnering with LifeWatch, uh, EMBL, EBI, and InRaya. And um, for this, um, the uh, first uh, milestone we have in place is to uh, come up with a guideline defining PIT practices into fair data management. And um, the end goal uh, would be um, guidelines for end users on how to implement uh, PITs to make uh, their data management workflows more fair. As part of this, um, we're going to organize three open uh, workshops uh, to discuss these uh, cross-cutting themes I've mentioned before. The first one is going to be about complex data citation and it's uh, going to take place on May 25th. Um, so if you're interested, um, you can um, uh, let me know in the break or stay tuned on the FAIR Impact events page where we'll launch the registration soon. And there are uh, going to be other um, two workshops as well throughout the project. And um, for the third task, we're focusing on the EOSC PID policy. The European Open Science Cloud community uh, came up with uh, a policy uh, around uh, PID uh, management in 2020. Um, so now uh, we're taking uh, some, uh, we're taking the opportunity of this project to uh, do a review of current uh, PIT policies in the community. Um, this has obviously uh, some nuances as uh, some organizations have uh, policies specifically for PIT management, uh, but some other organizations have PITs included as part of their open science uh, policies or publishing policies. Uh, so what we're doing as a first step is mapping those uh, policies for different stakeholders. And um, we've also um, last year at the EOS Symposium organized a session to discuss with the community, with the EOS community, uh, how are they managing uh, these policies and how aligned or not are they with the EOS PIT policy. And um, the long-term uh, goal for this is to come up with a guideline to create um, EOS-compliant uh, policies. And I've included the uh, FAIR uh, core for EOS logo. FAIR core um, is a sister project of FAIR Impact. So FAIR Impact is a support and coordination action, and FAIR core will actually develop the core elements of the EOSC. One of them is going to be a compliant assessment toolkit that's going to uh, be able to uh, assess uh, the compliance to the PIT policy, to the EOSC PIT policy in an automated way. And uh, this work is also being led by DANS. And uh, the last task of this uh, work package is the PIT implementation program. This task will actually start in June this year. And um, what we want to achieve is to offer um, support um, to organizations that are uh, going to develop services to be onboarded into the EOSC uh, core PIT services. Um, and on this task, we will be partnering with Work Package 2. And actually, um, DCC is one of the um, yeah, work package uh, leads. Um, and um, this is about engagement and adoption. So we're going to release uh, open calls um, to uh, have uh, demonstrators. Um, and um, yes, uh, 
this is not started yet, but will start later on this year. And yeah, this was uh, a short overview. If you have any uh, questions, um, uh, happy to answer them. Hello, good morning. My name is Laura Rosendi. I'm from Brazil. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Maria Pretelis from California Digital Library to inviting us to present the Brazilian initiative based on the MP2, um, specifically talking about our implemented features. Well, um, our team is uh, based on researchers from many institutions from uh, all the all the country, our regions of the country, and um, we were invited to 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 think and to develop and to study um, the the MP tools to choose the best option and to implement features according to a Brazilian uh, scenario. And this project is held by the uh, Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation, Innovation, specifically the IBICT, Institute of Scientific and Technology Information. And uh, I would like to present a video of this institution just to show the importance of it in our context. MCTI é o Ministério da Ciência, Tecnologia e Inovações, que está presente em tudo no seu dia a dia com as nossas entidades vinculadas, como as unidades de pesquisa, as organizações sociais, a empresa pública, as autarquias e a fundação. E todas essas entidades têm como objetivo produzir conhecimento e riquezas para o nosso Brasil, para assim contribuir permanentemente para a melhoria da qualidade de vida de todos os brasileiros. Instituto Brasileiro de Informação em Ciência e Tecnologia e PICT-MCTI tem como missão promover a competência, o desenvolvimento de recursos e a infraestrutura de informação em ciência e tecnologia para a produção, socialização e integração do conhecimento científico e tecnológico. Como um importante órgão nacional de informação, o IBICT MCTI está em constante atualização diante das novas tecnologias de informação e comunicação para cumprir o seu importante papel de incentivador do empreendedorismo e da inovação, como também de integrador das iniciativas brasileiras de informação científica e tecnológica. Em 1975, nascia o IBICT, sucedendo o antigo Instituto Brasileiro de Bibliografia e Documentação, IBBD. Desde então, tem como objetivos promover a criação e o desenvolvimento dos serviços especializados de bibliografia e documentação e estimular o intercâmbio entre bibliotecas e centros de documentação nacionais e internacionais. E mais incentivar e coordenar o melhor aproveitamento dos recursos bibliográficos e documentários do país pela comunidade científica. Todo esse trabalho, ao ser executado com maestria, faz do Brasil a terceira maior nação do planeta em quantidade de publicações periódicas de acesso livre. Somos ainda o quinto maior país em número de repositórios digitais à frente de potências econômicas como Japão, França, Itália e Austrália. Well, um, sorry. We our project started in November 2021 when we started to study the, the MP tools, the MP tools, especially machine actionable the MP tools. And um, 
in the beginning, we started a conceptual model, especially based on Mixer, Oblaster, and Rover. And uh, this is our model, our workflow that um, has a PGDBR, the, the, our, our, our tool on the, the center. And uh, on the left side, we have uh, the founder agencies uh, integrated with our uh, PGDBR system. And the idea is to have uh, the, the project and the calls, the calls from founder agency integrated with our t -t tool based on API. Um, on the top, we have uh, the login uh, uh, um, made by a federated, our federated network uh, on the, 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 the down we have our uh, data repositories that is managed by our institutional research institutions. Um, and these repositories uh, will be integrated um, and in indexed by Retrie data uh, that it's possible to, by PGDBR, the, the researcher can choose uh, the repository using Retrie data. Uh, the license will be managed by the repository uh, uh, institution and uh, information about costs. And we also have um, a digital preservation technology called Ipatia, that is from Ibict. And the idea is that all the, 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 the DMPs generated by our tool will be preserved using this technology. This is the main page of the, the PGDBR. Um, as I said, the login, the authentication will be especially using Brazilian Federated Network. And we had also our, la our latest uh, news using external link to our blog. Then the researcher can uh, select uh, the template that we, he will be using. That we have two options of templates. One that is uh, more simple and that has specially uh, closed-ended questions. And the other one is a complete template with questions um, uh, with answers based on FAIR principles. Um, after logging and when the, the researcher start uh, uh, creating his P, uh, his DMP, um, the logo of its institution will, will appear, will be incorporated in the DMP. And we also have a Brazilian CV database with a unique identifier that will be required uh, by the researcher to inform. We created uh, an alias to make easier to fill this information. When writing a DMP, uh, the researcher uh, will have uh, on the template number one that it's a simple version. We'll have um, these questions that are questions with closed ended. And um, then the researcher can choose a repository um, by retrieve data, specifically choose metadata standard and license that we'll be using based on the repository, the data repository that was chosen. Here is an example of uh, answers that um, are based on fair principles of the template number two, that it's a complete template with more options, with more uh, questions and um, we also will um, made available suggestions for answers and orientations for the researcher to do his best choice and to um, to do a best answer, uh, answer according to its project. For example, here uh, questions related to ethical and legal aspects. Um, we inform the, the best, the best uh, principles and the best option that uh, the researcher must choice, must choose. And um, when he finished 
uh, creating his DMP. In the DMP print version, uh, the institutional logo also will be incorporated. And um, for the funder uh, agents, agencies that are our partners, um, they will have options to customize a template according to our two options of templates that we made available, the simple and the complete with uh, conditioning questions. The, the founder agency, according to the calls that they will uh, uh, link to the, the template, they will choose um, the questions and the answers. And according to the answers, the, the, the next questions will appear or not. And here are future, future uh, implementations that we are going to implement according to the MP2 resources. Specifically, uh, the idea is, to, is that we, can, we, we will use uh, versioning, we, we, we will use research organization registry, cross have uh, uh, registry using uh, specifically metadata exchange you know, between tools, um, API from data site, integration with fair sharing, uh, taxonomy, uh, contribution roles taxonomy, integration with Dataverse, that it's a software that uh, our community chose um, to use mainly on our data repositories. DOI, we have by the, the Ministry of uh, uh, Information Technology, we will provide DOI to our institutions, research institutions that are, part, are our partners and uh, specifically federal institutions. And automatically, this DOI will be linked to the ARCAD information. Um, our first release is estimated to be launched on April next month. So uh, this is our experience. Thank you so much. And sorry <laughs> if some information uh, was not clear. Please call me, send me an email. That will be a pleasure to answer. All, all the questions. Thank you so much. It'll take a second or two. Francis. Yeah, you hear me now. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm just gonna uh, try and um, keep to the time. Kevin, just um, <laughs> let me know. Okay, so um, I think very quickly, um, it, it, this may be repeating what I said earlier, that the priority for DMP online is uh, essentially the same as the priorities uh, for the DMP roadmap project. And the number one priority is machine actionable DMPs. And we have some uh, features of this, for example, integration with ORCID, some integration with metadata, but there are uh, more um, uh, integrations in the pipeline and typically it's taking us a bit slower to implement them because our users, being a subscriber service, our users uh, demand a bit more scrutiny before the features are released. So. Um, at the moment, features to be released are the uh, integration with the uh, research organization registry, um, um, and that's for the organization field. Uh, when users create an account or uh, when they edit their profile, they will have the ability to select an organization from a drop down list, and this will come via an API of research organization registries. At the moment, if you remember, when you create a, a, a user account on uh, DMP online, you only see a restricted number of universities. These are typically universities that have a profile on the system, either because they have subscribed or because they have inquired uh, about subscription. So uh, it is a bit like that, but uh, we hope to implement this uh, as quickly as possible. It's well overdue. Um, then uh, another uh, fourth machine actionable um, feature coming is the integration with the uh, grant ID field. Um, for example, DMP Thule have asked us uh, to work on um, creating a grant, machine actionable grant ID field where the via an API, the uh, tool retrieves um, 
the grant from the National Research Fund, uh, and it can be this done the same for, for example, uh, European grants for uh, other national services. Um, once we have the facility in place, we can implement it for um, other uh, uh, repositories of grants. Uh, another feature coming is the research outputs feature. Um, Ma Maria gave you a demonstration. It's going to be exactly the same as in, um, uh, in DMP roadmap. Um, uh, I'll, I'll show you the, uh, some screenshots later, but uh, this is already available in um, uh, DMP roadmap. It's just that we haven't been able to release it. We discussed it in uh, at a meeting in uh, at our user group meeting in January, I think, and we got a lot of feedback from our users saying this needs more tweaks before you can release it. Uh, we want uh, a, a few more features added to it, and I'll, I'll go very briefly through it. And at the moment, another there are two um, things that. Uh, uh, DM, this digital curation center is leading on uh, as development priorities for uh, DMP roadmap. One is the new plan creation wizard. Um, again, we discussed this as well with our user group, and we were given a lot of feedback. There, are, there will be a subset of that group said they were quite they were interested in in working quite closely with us on defining that feature. The new plan creation wizard. Uh, sorry if I'm repeating myself a bit. Is to enable the user to select the most appropriate template to make it clearer for them what is the best template. This will be based on filters, um, and so far we've been asked for. Uh, for a couple of filters one is uh, the uh, funder another one is organization however here in the room uh please wave <laughs> somebody's just told me uh i uh, somebody's just told me that actually we want grants uh specific for um uh you know uh field of study so i want a template for chemistry can i actually have that as well as a filter so you see these um although we like to release the features as simple as possible um there are demands people people want additional functionality so it, it, we are at the stage where we uh, are writing the specifications for these features and we will be, we'll be working with our users on that and then we take them to the roadmap team and uh, we see how we can deploy it together, how we can write a code for a functioning feature and deploy it for all of the tools within DMP roadmap. Um, Okay, how do we, um, this is just a very quick overview on um, how do we decide these, I just want to reiterate. So we decide our priorities based on uh, customer requests, um, so our existing subscribers, uh, particularly at the moment, it, it, the subscribers, the subscribing organizations are the leader in asking and uh, pushing forward new, uh, new features. Um, of course, we work with Roadmap on, and the, uh, the Roadmap team on coming up with uh, new ideas and fixing or tweaking features. Um, uh, our subscribers also ask us for specific customized features. Uh, then there are uh, funded collaborative projects. And I know that, uh, for example, um, funders uh, are a community that are slowly getting more and more involved. Uh, the uh, Dutch national funder has asked us for, uh, for example, for a feature that enables them to approve templates customized by institutions, a bit like the feedback feature on a plan, but they want to, uh, that feedback feature to be enabled for approving templates, which is, which is very interesting. Uh, so we have to uh, deliver that at some point as well. Um, but we always need to, to ensure that they work. We always need to test them with the end user. So it is a bit slower, but we're getting there. And uh, I'm really pleased to see the community so involved, both users and subscribing organizations, um, constantly asking for, for new functionality. Um, okay, so sorry about this. Okay, so the research outputs feature, very, very quickly, uh, I think I've got another five minutes, am I not kidding? Okay, so the research uh, outputs feature is going to look essentially is like a tab and we, an additional tab to the to the plan. You can see, you can recognize these, um, you know, project details, contributors, plan, review, share, all of that, it's been there for a while. The research outputs feature is something that we can roll out, can roll out very, very quickly. However, we've been asked to make it clear to the end user that this is 
optional and we've also been asked to make it clear that can is perhaps best to fill it in towards the end of the project we thought we could implement it like this just add a couple of lines there these are not set in stone we can revise them and we point people to the help page which is a customizable page where institutions can add more guidance of their own so we met with a subset of the a user group who said Actually, we would love, people won't read the help page, by the way. Um, we would love to be able to customize this page, an institution. And we thought, mm, we have to take that to the roadmap to actually discuss whether we can customize every single page within the uh, uh, tool. Um, then there was somebody who, uh, I think it was Mark Brunel, who asked, uh, Brunel, sorry if I mispronounced your name, who asked for an API where we can retrieve the research outputs and, and uh, uh, generate, uh, similar to what, what Maria mentioned, and, and generate reports of um, and downloads for um, research outputs. And then um, I think it's Joachim uh, Philipson, apologies if I mispronounce your name. Joachim said, actually, I don't think you need to customize this page. And yes, I agree that the help page won't be read. I suggest that you actually expand the functionality from the project, from the right plan and add here guidance on the right hand side, add guidance and the ability to comment. That functionality already exists in the tool and we thought, actually, why not? It sounds quite good. Um, plan versioning, again, we discussed this, I think, in November with our users. Um, We've been asked to do uh, versions of plans uh, to to, gen to create the ability to um, insert versions of plans, and we ask people when, why do they need uh, versions uh, of plans? Uh, I think it's the end. This request is a, one of the few requests that came initially from the end users. They said, "I like to clearly indicate." to see my plan before I was given feedback, the, my original plan and the plan after <laughs> I was given feedback. And I would also want a version of the plan that I actually submitted, downloaded and submitted to the funder. So uh, we thought we would implement it like this. It's a, it's a familiar interface. You'll be like, you know, you'd have on your dashboard plan A, plan B, plan C. You would click on the plan and we'd add a, a view version history. And then, um, in the next screen, you would see your plan. It's the same plan, and uh, you will have details of the, uh, further details of this version. Um, and the the version will be identified. Uh, ha will have its own ID. Um, you can give it a name, version one, two, three, whatever you want, or you can give it a different kind of name. It can it will be downloadable. We will see who is the last person that modified it, who of the contrib plan contributors modified it, modification date, and you would also have. Uh, uh, you know, the ability to remove, edit, um, uh, you know, restore it, do essentially will be like an additional screen within your tool where you can uh, manipulate um, uh, your plan that way. As I said, we need to work on this a bit more because um, it could become a bit confusing with uh, for templates that have um, multiple phases like the Horizon 2020 template. But um, I, I, we think it, it can work, and uh, since it's been requested by the end user, um, we're prepared to put in the effort. Okay, so very quickly, um, some of you have inquired about uh, subscription, and um, I just want to show that the, the level of customization that we can put within the tool, and I showed earlier national implementations. Um, so... Um, we we have done uh, customizations of the tool. We have the ability to, uh, if you like, dress the tool in your in your um, uh, in institutional branding. And I can show uh, the uh, uh, a, a couple of examples. This is the University of Manchester. So this is the University of Manchester implementation of uh, DMP online, and this is a link to their website. I've picked on Manchester for no reason. Sorry, Chris, possibly because you're very active. This is uh, Umea University, another uh, university I've picked off my list. So it, it, it's part of our multi-tenancy service, which is available on subscription. Now, um, I, I noticed that on national, uh, if you saw my, my list of national implementations earlier, um, 
it makes sense to download a roadmap tool and create a national service, right? Particularly if you have, particularly if you have the funding and the um, the the coding resources, you know, the developer efforts in there, and you can rely on that developer effort being there because otherwise creating a, 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 a customized you know instance just for your own institution it becomes a bit harder you know you you could lose your developer and and that's it you're stuck it, it, it can become very very difficult to maintain the tool not extremely difficult but you still need the developer effort so be conscious of that so this is why we thought that the multi-tenancy model would be quite useful uh, particularly for uh, institutional implementations so we store the tool we update it we apply the updates it's just a matter of um, giving it uh, you know the look of an institutional tool and you can also uh, do single sign-on um, okay and future challenges i'm going to do them very very quickly because i'm running over time um, there, there are things that we'll have to discuss at some point with our users, and they're also relevant to, to Roadmap, because I find that on subscribed services, customers in particular come back with um, more and more requests for, for features. Um, they also expect data uh, exports. And I find that, that at the moment, for example, in, in our current data model, uh, the, is the end user, the researcher who owns the plant. So if they switch university, they go away with all of their plants and they should, so they should. I mean, it, it's something that they worked on. It, they are their plants, but many universities say, well, they're based on our templates. Perhaps that is, um, <laughs> perhaps that is, I don't know, confidential information. I'm not convinced about that, but it's a discussion that we need to have because when the tool was originally set up, the end user was the was the owner. And is that still not a valid model? That's something that we need to talk about. Um, and we need to talk about that there are more and more requests for features. I find that the end users have asked for you know, a relatively simple interface. They don't ask for that many features, um, um, but they do all the work of inputting the data. I find that it's us, the research data management community and the uh, university um, uh, of, you know, research data management offices that are asking for more and more features. So we need to think if the researchers are putting the data in, how does it benefit them? You know, they're, they're adding data to yet another system. Yes, we're getting APIs. Yes, you're getting input and you're linking to other organizations to do some pre-filling of information. But I find that we're asking them to enter more and more information. I'm a bit concerned about that. But it's not, you know, it's not a huge uh, uh, problem at the moment. But we need to think about it, both when we ask users to enter more data and when we ask uh, for more features. And another thing is how to get funders more involved, because at the moment, um, it's us who are maintaining uh, the uh, funder templates. Apart from the uh, National Dutch funder, I haven't had uh, many proactive requests for, uh, can I update my template, please? So um, I think we need to get um, uh, more funders involved. Okay, thank you. Sorry, this is so, so rushed. No, no, thank you very much, uh, Yeah. So you make time for one very brief question, if it also permits a very brief answer, and if not, yeah, so at the back there, um, and can we get the microphone? And you can use my mic, Tiana, to just speak into it. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I wanted to ask if you're using any persistent identifier to identify the DMPs because you've mentioned ORCID and ROAR, but uh, you didn't mention a specific identifier for the DMPs. So wondering about that. At the moment, the tool assigns uh, an ID to the uh, uh, to the plan. Uh, we haven't had uh, many integrations with uh, um, persistent identifiers, but we are planning. We are working on that. As I said, it it's it's our number one priority but we we have to implement them yeah, it's, yeah. it will be the same as as in roadmap really because i think it could also help address some of the challenges like if you implement a pit then you can connect the researchers to that yeah. and give them credit and recognize their work yeah that's right Thanks. so yeah Okay, thanks very much for that. And we're, we're going to have to, uh, I think, draw that to, to a close now, but lots more perhaps we could pick up over lunch. Um, so now on to a presentation that, according to uh, our 
um, program was going to be recorded, but uh, I think we've heard at the last minute uh, that in fact, uh, Alison Lister from Fair Sharing is going to be presenting to us uh, live. Uh, so without, no for, without further ado, I'll hand over now uh, to Alison. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Is everything working all right at your end? Can you see my slides and hear me? We can see your slides and we can hear you. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. Yes, I've recorded it, but it turns out I not I don't travel for another few hours. So I realized I could come in and speak with you directly. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. And also thank you to Marek and Thomas for all their help this week on preparing these slides together. I think it'll be a, a great overview of what fair sharing can do to help give you content when you are developing uh, machine actual machine actionable data management plans and the tools we use to build them. So now I'm just going to click through. Here we go. So a very, very brief overview of fair sharing itself. We've heard it mentioned a few times this morning, so I know that you're all, many of you are aware, but fair sharing provides curated descriptions and relationship graphs of standards, databases, and policies. So we build a whole ecosystem, a view of the ecosystem, of the landscape of resources available to researchers across all research areas. And we work to promote your standards, databases, and policies uh, across all sectors and all disciplines, and of course, all stages of the research life cycle, because we do let people know if a resource we have registered in fair sharing is ready in development, deprecated, or even if we can't quite find the right information for it at that moment in time. We have lots of different users, and these broadly go within two groups, the consumers who come to fair sharing to discover, select, and use the resources that we describe, and also the producers of those resources who come to fair sharing to describe their standards, databases, and policies with us to make them more visible and more adopted. So fair sharing has nearly coming up very soon, I think we'll be at 4,000 records across these three registries, over 1,200 contributors. These are people outside of the immediate fair sharing team and are either maintainers of the records. So these are developers of those standards, databases, or policies, or part of our community champion program, which I'll mention briefly at the end. And just to show we've had steady growth over the years and we have many records across lots of different disciplines. We also have lots and lots of different stakeholders. We work actively with a number of communities, including the RDA, which of course we're all here for this week, as well as a number of different infrastructures, publishers, funders, and different user groups, such as societies, data stewards, librarians, and all sorts of other groups. Very briefly, we have a strong history of working within the RDA. We are um, part of the fair, share, fair Sharing Working Group is a working group within the RDA. We also work with the Data Repository Attribute Working Group towards the development of a common set of attributes for databases. And we've also worked, as, as you all know, through the, with the DCC and Fair is Fair and the lovely Joy Davidson uh, to, to align both the data policy checklist they've produced and the journal data policy features as the output of an RDA interest group. So we have worked already to build features into fair sharing records that are relevant for this particular community. And when we put features into fair sharing, when we add metadata to the records describing your resources, that metadata is then fully accessible to any third party tools that make use of fair sharing. This is primarily done through the use of our API, which allows for lookup and content retrieval and selection for those standards, policies, and repositories. And this helps with the creation of data management plans, for example, the data stewardship wizard um, makes, makes use, and I'm going to show you an example of that in a moment, and also for the enrichment of guidance or training material for assessment of fairness. If you go to fairsys.org, you'll see a lot of fair evaluation and assessment tools, many of which use the fair sharing API. And just a little note here about the uh, EOSC Fair Metrics and Data Quality Task Force, where they've been working on working the the various fair evaluation tools have been working together to create a, a cohesive way of interacting and assessing uh, the fairness of digital objects. Here's a very brief overview of our API simply because this is the machine actionable data management plan session. And so just knowing a little bit about how the API works, please see me. I will be at pre uh, in person at the RDA from tomorrow. Uh, and, and I'm happy to talk with any aspect of this with you. But essentially it provides JSON 
and it allows you to use a REST interface to interact with fair sharing. So now on to the specific exa example that you guys are interested in, the, the machine actionable data management plans and how we can help you with that. So we provide curated metadata and stable references, that is things like DOIs for the each of these resources that you can access. So tools can search and pull our content, including all the different data descriptors that we have. Things of interest to you might be funder information, the people and organizations who develop a resource, other types of related organizations, license information that's available for um, use within a repository or th that applies to particular standards, database conditions like access and deposition conditions, data preservation policies, things like this. And this content can be represented uh, through these the, the DOIs that reference our records uh, within machine actionable data management plans and also any additional metadata that might be required can be retrieved. And I'll just show you a little bit more of an example. So if we take a particular example that Marek Thomas and I worked through last week, we have GBIF, a biodiversity database. On the left, you have the record in fair sharing, and on the right, you have its relationships, its relationship graph, all of the different resources that somehow connect to GBIF. And the other example we'll use here is the ecological modeling language, which is a format that GBIF outputs and so is linked in that relationship graph I showed you on the previous page. And here we have the record describing EML and its relationship graph. So how are we going to use these in the context of data management plans? Well, the lovely Merrick has provided us with a few, a few screenshots and mockups of ways in which we can do this. So what's happened here is we've got someone searching for ecological modeling language um, as a format that they want to use and a reference database or data set as they're looking for GBIF. And they can find these things. And when they find these things, they're finding them from fair sharing with data stewardship wizard uh, searching through the API. And this is a live example that he's used in some of his other presentations where it shows the route from data stewardship wizard through the API, getting the information from fair sharing and representing that. So what we want to do is we want to show a little bit more here. And these and this JSON has been provided as an example from, by, by Thomas and it's available in the GitHub repository where he has all the other examples. You end up with a machine actionable data management plan that mentions the fair sharing DOI for both EML and for GBIF. And you can see that the description for these have been pulled from fair sharing into the JSON. So what you're getting is access, not just to these bits of metadata and the identifiers used to describe uh, these resources within fair sharing, but you also get the whole the whole set of descriptors that are available for that record. So before I finish, I am just going to give a shout out to our lovely community champions. I used an example of GBIF, and the reason I did that is because one of our community champions comes, well, in fact, three of them come from GBIF, and they have done a great job of making over 500 edits to records over the last few months as part of their work as a community champion. But what is that? I hear you say. It's a way for domain experts from the RDA, from EOSC, from anywhere, anywhere worldwide, who might wish to come to Fair Sharing to help curate our content and contribute to educational material, which we will be tweeting about this week, some of the work they've done there, and also to gain expertise in, in data curation and gain networking and attribution for all their work in a variety of different ways. So it's only right that I attribute them here. And here is our current group of community champions. And not only do they get attributed in presentations like this, but also we push their attribution to their ORCID profiles. So they get very public um, attribution for their work, for their volunteer efforts with us. And I encourage you to go and take a look at them. And if you see any of them here at the RDH today to say hello. Uh, this week, as I say, they've been working on educational material, which we are going to publish very shortly. This page will go live and you will see a variety of initial infographics and fact sheets appear this week um, at, as part of the RDA plenary. I just wanted to say thank you. I've come under my 10 minutes because I know we're running a little late and I also wanted to give time if anyone wanted for questions, but equally I'm happy to answer any questions throughout the week uh, once I once either either later on in virtually or in person later this week. Thank you.
Great. Uh, thanks very much, Alison. And as yeah, we do have time, I think, for one brief question. So is there one from anyone in the room or do we have one? Online, there's a microphone waiting here for you. If not, uh, then uh, as Alison said, there will be the opportunity to catch up with her uh, later in the week here in person for those of you uh, who are with us uh, here in, in Gothenburg. Uh, now I'd like to hand over to our last presenter for today before we get into the uh, discussion sessions. Uh, so uh, Benjamin uh, Foray from DMP uh, Opidor. And, you, yep. and do we just want to start the... You that one. And take it away, Benjamin. Uh, do, do you want to use this? Yeah, okay. Thank you. So, uh, today I will talk to you about uh, the MPOP door and uh, more specifically the machine actionability in the French ecosystem. And today I decided uh, to put myself at risk and do a live demo uh, of some of these features. But first, a bit of context about uh, the MPOP door. So the MPOP door is the French instance of uh, the MP roadmap. Uh, it, it, uh, we, we work with 63 research organizations and we have more than 12 thousand users and uh, 15,000 DMPs. And it's been in production since, since uh, November 2016. And uh, we've we here on this slide, we have some examples of uh, our national partners and international part partners. In France, we are working, for example, with uh, universities such as the University of Lorraine, or the INRAE or the French uh, Bio Bioinformatics Institute. And uh, there's the French uh, funding agency, the ANR. Um, in uh, November 2021, we've introduced a new, a new set of features that we called structured templates. Uh, they are uh, DMP templates with some specific features and you can uh, fill your DMP in a structured way uh, with use of internal registries, uh, more on that on the, this link. Uh, you have two new uh, tabs on your DMP, a budget summary and a contributors tab. And there's some features such as export your, D your DMP as JSON or import some information from the French funder registry. Um, I will, won't go into a lot of details here, but basically uh, structured uh, templates uses a JSON schema to create some structured forms. And um, these schemas are basically information about the type of fields that are displayed in the form and uh, some information about the labels and everything. And when you fill your DMP in a structured template, everything is recorded, is recorded in JSON in the database. And in 2022, we uh, did some more updates such as plan imports uh, using uh, our own uh, data model and the uh, RDA common standard format. And uh, we have some other features such as an API, API swagger and some things that we call external services, access rights, and uh, research outputs, UUIDs. And now I will try to switch fast to my demo. Here. Okay. So. First of all, I'd like to show you the feature that we, we um, where you can import some information from the French uh, Funder Agency. 
So when you go into the general info tab, let me switch in English here. You go to the general info tab and here you can type your project title or your grant ID and you can import some information from the, the national research, um, funding agency. Sorry, I'm not used to QWERTY. And basically this information now, right now are stored as a, um, in our database, but in the future, we want to uh, plug this feature on the French uh, agency API that that is not available at the moment, but it, in the future, we hope to plug it in. Um, we have some, um, bas basically um, our first, uh, our first, um, uh, structured template is based on the Science of Europe stem template, where we um, made a mapping with our type of information. So you have information about, for example, the research output description or the storage type, storage information. And uh, if you are, for example, a storage platform, you can uh, customize uh, the form with some features. So for example, here I am using the a form that's been um, made for a storage platform and you you can you have some for example inf a lot of information about this um, this uh, storage platform you have their backup policy for example and here i can for example request some um, some uh, some storage so i'd like for example to have let's say one terabyte of storage, not minus 10, more like 10, please. Uh, at the moment, uh, the user has to create manually some information that are constant, but we are working on uh, uh, having this information pre-filled when you choose your um, template or your form. But at the moment, it's not really practical. That's why we're working on it. Um, some of these forms are some features for computing data, uh, data storage costs, for example. So everything that you fill in your DMP, you can click here and the, the cost will be uh, computed automatically. So here I, am, I have forgotten to fill the storage time here. And as you can see, the cost have been, has been computed automatically. And if, if you want, if you're ready to submit your storage uh, request, you can notify your, the storage uh, structure. Uh, now I will be talking about the import uh, functionalities. So here we can, for example, use the DMP command standard format and I downloaded earlier something from the RDA command standard GitHub and I can uh, just import this this DMP as JSON in my uh, in my account and as you can see everything is filled here if you go to the contributors tab you here you can see there's some interesting characters and uh, you, for example, if I um, if I go to the budget tab, there's nothing at the moment. But as you can see, our contributors tab, every role of the contributors are set in their research output. Uh, we have our own implementation of the research output feature, so that's why you you see some tabs here. It's specific to the MPOP door. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can export all of uh, your DMP as a JSON, as JSON in format. So you can choose RDA Commerce Order or our own format. And I'd like to finish with something that we call, um, let me click, please, here. Uh, 
Um, when when you're using one of these forms, you might want to um, you might want to to share uh, the content of your DMP with an external platform. And uh, if you if you share this your DMP, the the access right the this platform will will have access to a part of your DMP. Um, here, I will notify this one. Oh no, it's not working at the moment. Sorry. <laughs> so basically, we've added some features that you can uh, you can restrict the access to your DMP to a storage platform, and through our API, they can um, they can uh, get your DMP. Um, I can switch here. Uh, this is the swagger I mentioned earlier that it's really useful for uh, developers uh, using the MPOP door or testers uh, if they want to test the API. Uh, I'd like to talk about the, the research output UUIDs, which are unique identifiers for a research output. And uh, when you're using this identifier or you notify your uh, storage platform that you want to share data with them this uh, identifier will be can be used to access the um, the tmp restricted to the research output associated to it um i think i'm done for the day demo if you have some questions Absolutely great. Thank you very much, Benjamin. So indeed, we do have a couple of minutes for questions before we go in to the breakout groups. Um, so I can see there is one uh, at the back there. So we do have... It's gone missing. So. We, we had somebody online, uh, so that I, I think they just put their hand down as well. I think it was somebody called Paul or Pauliet. Okay, well, we take take the one in the room first, uh, and yeah. Oh, can I start? So, uh, do you have any con connection with the Halo repository? Not only sharing your DMP uh, itself, but also um, connecting with the Halo repository and uh, depositing the the content into the Halo repository in terms of the DMP. No, at the moment we don't have a connection with Hal. Uh, maybe in the future because we like to work with with uh, we like to implement some connectors uh, with external services. For example, I talked about uh, registry registries which are stored in our database at the moment, and uh, in the future we'd like to synchronize these registries with the the, the APIs that are, that are producing them. And uh, for maybe in the future, we can uh, implement connectors to uh, export uh, your DMP in uh, some external services. So we're not going to attempt to do this in a hybrid fashion. Those of you online, there are four breakout rooms there being created, uh, and they're going to deal uh, with four subjects uh, that I'm about to go through. So first, uh, there's a notion I think raised uh, by our colleagues uh, from, from Japan about extending vocabularies in the standard to accommodate uh, the particular requirements that, that you have there. And I'm sure there are broader examples of that. Uh, another related issue, I think, again, to do with the standards and extensions. Brian uh, Riley gave examples in the presentation about UC3 where you've needed to add, I think, I don't know if it's additional attributes uh, or things around individuals uh, that we need to express and capture in data management plans that at the moment uh, a standard doesn't address. So I think working on ways to say, is this a failure with the standard? Is this, or, or is this something where we can easily design the standard in a way to have this kind of extensibility uh, in, in, in future? I think would be a good uh, two topics there uh, for groups uh, to, to, to address. Uh, but the third group, lots of what we've been talking about has revolved around PIDs, permanent identifiers. Some of what we've been describing has been the use of, of 
pulling in identifiers that actually exist elsewhere and sometimes bringing information with them. In other cases, people have been talking about using the data management plans to push identifiers, such as the identifiers for the plans themselves into other systems to allow actions to take place there. And I think we've also seen some other examples of, of actions where we're using the identifiers within the system itself, within OPDOR or DMP Online or DMP Tool or any of the others uh, to make actions happen within that system itself. Uh, and do we need to prioritize any one of those particular actions or are they all equally valuable uh, in, in trying to make machine actionable data management plans part of a broader uh, ecosystem? And the final topic for discussion, I think is more around who benefits. I think it was particularly interesting in the last example, we've seen some others, you showed examples there, Benjamin, where entering a small amount of information on the part of the researcher brought in a good deal of information from elsewhere. And indeed, Alison Lister's presentation on fair sharing showed similar examples. There's no question there that we're using machine actionability there to make life easier for the researcher who's creating the plan, to make life easier for others who need to review it and deal with it. I worry in some other cases that we're asking people to do a lot of work in pushing identifiers into plans and the benefits lie uh, uh, elsewhere. And if that's the case, uh, and if we're moving in, in, in that direction, uh, how do we do that? Because I think in general, if you have a system where the people who have to do the work aren't the people who get the benefits in the long run, this is not gonna be sustainable. Um, so for those of you physically in the room here, we just suggest uh, either use the, uh, the, the, the the tables that we've got. We don't have any other physical breakout rooms, do we? Or we're just doing that uh, in here. Those of you online, report back. I'm gonna ask for each group, appoint somebody to do some reporting back. You'll need to do that. I'm gonna ask you to keep to 60 seconds in your reporting back. I think the simplest thing to do is to identify from the 25 minutes or so of discussion, you'll have one, two or at most three points to feedback uh, that you think are of use to, to the rest of the room. I hope that's all clear. Um, we're going to come back into plenary uh, in about 25 minutes time, uh, just after quarter two. To all of our online attendees, and if we can have a bit of calm in the room and do your discussions, those of you here physically, I'm going to ask the online attendees to report back um first um and thanks for your patience with that so if we can start with room one who is going to report back from there lisa lisa van loo is that you so go ahead yeah remember you've got 60 seconds um well i think the main takeaway from our room um was i was in a breakout room with falco from a, a denmark instance um and the main takeaway is that there's um different kinds of users with different kinds of goals uh, within the community um, because uh, for me I'm from the from the Belgian DMP online instance and for us DMP online is a, is an administrative tool to to make administration easier and so uh, machine actionability is like yeah let's get it um, but for Falco he uses it more as a learning tool and so this extra strictness and extra giving in of information, um, it, it didn't seem quite as logical just because he, he uses it differently than, than we do. Um, okay, was, uh, and I'm sure that that issue you've raised there, Lisa, I'm sure is a much broader thing. The idea of, yeah, what are we actually using this tool for? Um, and those things are varying a bit and that does vary what we want to do with it and what, as you say, in some cases, what it makes really sense to be mandatory over here uh, really does get in the way over there. And I think anybody who's ever worked in research in university, also when we hear those words, another administrative tool, uh, it fills us with a sense of dread that this is yet another thing that we're going to be asked to put information in to and not necessarily get benefit back. So thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, that's really interesting. Okay. We'll move on. Room two online. Who's going to be reporting back? I think I was uh, I was asked to report back. Alison, yeah, brief. go ahead. <laughs> yes, we had a group of five or six people. It was very good. We touched briefly on the various wish lists and things like that that were the options for for the ways that things could be extended. 
Um, we had a few different, uh, I guess, axes of discussion. One was about more than data and data management plans. We have a fast and loose definition of data in fair sharing. Sometimes we like to talk about uh, software repositories as well. So in data management plans, uh, when is it appropriate to talk about other sorts of digital objects, pushing all different types of data into data management plans. Certainly software management plans are, are around and that, and Paulette mentioned that as well. So, but it's about thinking about if we can have one cohesive whole rather than having to generate lots of different documents. Uh, also the fact that for some of their users, template DMPs uh, don't always fit their objects and their type of data, especially in, for, for their user, it was um, geosciences and bioinformatics. And then another of the people in the breakout groups talked about how there's a problem of scope sometimes with data management plans. Um, when you're talking about research consortia, making them versus individual projects and um, and smaller projects and local needs and how we and, and thinking about that kind of thing. So I think I think that was uh, then we got slightly distracted about differences between data policies and data management plans. That was my fault. But other than that, that was our summary. No, no, that, that, that's really interesting all the same. Alison, thank you very much uh, for giving me to that. So um, room three. Who is your appointed rapporteur? Peter, Peter Nish, go ahead. Uh, yes, thanks. Um, in room three, um, we were talking about PIDs and um, whether the focus should be on harvesting or pushing um, or machine actionability within the DMP and really, um, yeah, our discussion, um, Valentina Pasquale mainly, we just um, talked really about, well, it depends. Um, it depends on the scenario, on your workflow, what's important. For example, you know, searching the fair sharing for a resource, you, you, you would potentially get back a PID, which then gets stored in the DMP, or you might have a data set, which you might want to push out to say a data repository or a data catalog somewhere else. So um, really we kind of decided, yeah, the important thing to focus on really is that the DMPs can maintain and be a place to maintain those links with the various resources. So yeah, that's that's probably the, the short summary of our discussion. Okay, uh, that, that's interesting. So in a sense, you're seeing the DMP as almost a, a, a collection of identifiers that help knit together uh, lots of things that may be happening in other places. That's right. Yeah. So, they, yeah. Great. So I'm sure, did we have a fourth online room or was it just three rooms? There were four. Okay, so who from room four? Going once, going twice. Nobody from room four willing to talk back to us? Uh, hi, I'm Suni. Ah, I'm, hi, Suni. Yeah, yeah hi, hi. Yeah, I can uh, help chip in for uh, group four. Uh, this is about benefits to researchers who are filling in the DMPs. Uh, well, um, we have uh, identified the following. Uh, they could perhaps uh, save some trouble in having to refill some information, uh, for example, about their research outputs, uh, if we can make use of that magical tool that was presented earlier where you have a data set that is published uh, in the data repository and then um, that information gets to be populated in the DMPs. Wow, that is a wonderful uh, magic wand that we would like to use. Um, perhaps the other benefit could be some kind of uh, uh, potential workflows like um, uh, by having uh, something very machine readable, the researchers could perhaps get uh, to have access to some kind of data storage uh, of a good size that is um, uh, suitable to their needs. Um, the other potential benefit could be um, to be able to um, uh, uh, look at the cost that could be needed when it comes to data management and uh, perhaps can leverage on that information. Uh, and of course, last but not least would be the reporting. So uh, reporting for the researchers, uh, for the projects, uh, uh, multiple projects, for example, uh, it might make 
reporting easier. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Sini. And I think an interesting connection there with what one of the other groups said about you know, why are we using this? So if you know that reporting is one of those things that you have to do, then making it easier is certainly a benefit. On the other hand, if you're using something as a learning tool, you might be thinking, reporting? Who cares about that? That's not what I'm here to do. So that, again, it comes back to this reason why we're even using this in the first place. So now I'm going to move to reporting back from in the room. I'd, I'd like to start uh, with the table uh, furthest away, the one that Tomash is setting up, but I don't know who's going to be reporting back uh, from there. Yeah, you will. So, apologies. That. Um, so we discussed questions one and two. We discussed about vocabularies, and uh, we understood that what our colleagues are doing is they use the wikis if there is no vocabulary and use semantic semantic wiki to basically point to the concepts and to wikis they maintain themselves. So this didn't this this didn't sound seem to be a big problem. And we also discussed about the extensions to the uh, standard. And here we had to clarify what extension means, whether it's uh, modifying the core definition or creating something on top of it. And, and currently, uh, the colleagues are also using extensions. And basically, we need to continue the discussion on what we do about this tomorrow in the session, because this seems to be quite complex. And I would like to uh, ask you to join tomorrow's session. <laughs> Absolutely. That's good. Yeah, great. So if you want to hand that now to the table just in, that was just in front of you. Um, and you don't need to come to the front. We're going to switch the camera view so those online can see you. So um, we uh, we were discussing the, the fourth question, even though we're the second in line. So I was a bit confused, but I think I figured it out. Uh, and our takeaways um, were, were four things. And I'll start with the fourth one first and come back to it, which is ask researchers the question because a bunch of RDM folks may not be able to best answer the question. Um, the right question sort of for us is about uh, collective benefit and not necessarily about the immediate benefit to the researchers themselves when they're using some of these tools and their functions. Um, a second important thing that came out was understanding the sweet spot between sort of automation and a lot of the tools and bells and whistles that we've heard about today um, that come with MADMPs and more sort of long-term freeform answers insofar as, uh, you know, when you offer a dropdown with one or two options, you may actually be uh, discouraging the researcher from sort of expounding upon things that may actually be important for their research and for the, the data steward, in my case, um, to understand what's actually happening there. So I think that this is a really delicate balance that needs to be struck, um, as, does my as do my colleagues at the table over there. Um, the third is that over time, um, to consider that researchers will eventually sort of sell the DMP tools for you, um, but this is going to take some time for people to get to learn how to use them, but ultimately whatever payoff is there um, will happen sort of at, at scale. Uh, it'll, like I said, just take a little bit of time. And the fourth, once again, is to really ask researchers because this is about them as much as it is, if not more than it is about us. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and just pass the, the mic then straight to this table. Oh, mm -hmm. who wants the mic? Anybody? Somebody on this table. You've been given the mic to me because we had a very broad ranging discussion. And it's impossible to summarize. So uh, mm -hmm. I'll do my best in, uh, in the midst of all this uh, chaos. But uh, so we had the three questions about what was the priority in terms of focusing on PIDs. And I think I think we thought that, you know, it depends and, and maybe none of them are really priorities. Um, we kind of took a step back and tried to look at what are some of the issues with, with using PIDs, in particular in tools like, like DMPs, but also other kinds of tools as well. And then we had interesting contributions from someone from SURF, from an individual institution, from a funder, uh, from someone who's actually who's helped, helped create a, a resource to create uh, standards uh, for PIDs, and then from, um, from DMP tool as to their perspectives on 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 the issues relating to PIDs. That probably sounds a little bit vague, but that was the best I could do. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and finally, to, to, were you actually discussing something here at this table where you, you uh, I believe you, you, you were, you said, but yeah. I think you said you perhaps not address those questions, but. 
but discuss something useful anyway. Actually, we didn't talk about the four questions, but uh, <laughs> at, the, at that table, we talk about something broader and we talk about how to assess, uh, how to assess the DMP and how to assess the output according to the DMP. And we proposed another question for the research projects in, uh, involved uh, internet, uh, international researchers from different countries, maybe they have different DMP in their own country, how to make their work together and uh, to make it interoperable between the DMP from different countries is another work. Uh, that's all. Uh, any other things? Oh, great. Oh, thank, thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much. And I really am, I've been told we absolutely have to be out of this room uh, on, on time. Um, um, we're, we're very much on the end. So it just remains for me to say very briefly, uh, if you want, uh, you remember I mentioned that the data management plan checklist that started it all off. This is not the very valuable first edition, but the fourth edition from some years later. They're there, they're available with a few other things by the side of the room. I want to say thank you to my colleagues at the DCC and the roadmap partners for making this happen, to the RDA for letting us do this, and indeed to the RDA for providing the venue for the working groups, to all our presenters, and to all of you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.